I'm Kim. I do own a float center. Um, my husband and I own Sukino Float Center in Salt Cave. We're in Southern Indiana. And I also have a company called Mindful Solutions. And I do all kinds of marketing and training and, and uh, other uh, work. I'm not selling anything today. I'm just telling you this is what I do. Marketing is my main thing and running the float center as well. But um, we're hiring staff who can really do that. So I get to focus a lot more on um, understanding and learning marketing. I'm constantly soaking it all in. I also uh, am a co-host on Art of the Float. And for some crazy reason, they decided to let me be the president of the float conference um, for a little bit. So oh, thank you, thank you. Um, I told Ashcon he picked a really good year to uh, take a break from that, you know. So let me reshare. Here we go. We're going to start just right at it. And I um, have a template that I'll provide to you guys. If you want to leave, we'll start a, a little sign-up sheet. Actually, Tiffany, will you uh, pull out a piece of paper and pass that around? If you would like a copy of our template um, for a marketing plan, just jot your email address down, and then I'll send you a link where you can download that template. Um, and what I really want to do today is just talk about some kind of basic marketing things. Some things you may already be doing, some things you may not. But I also really want to generate some discussion because there's so much knowledge um, in this room already that I think you guys can share as much as I do and that we can all kind of pick and choose and, and learn things that other centers are doing and finding successful or you can share something that you are doing as well. So when I would start with a SWOT analysis, you may have heard of SWOT before. SWOT is something you should do for everything and repeat it again and again and again. So a SWOT analysis, it doesn't have to be anything formal, but essentially what you're doing is you're looking at your strengths. And you can do this from a business level and then within each business function, the same analysis. So what are your strengths in your operation? So this could be things like customer service. You are just really great with people. Um, a weakness might be that you're terrible running your numbers, doing bookkeeping. That's me. I, I just hate it. So that's a weakness for me. Opportunities are, are areas where you might be doing okay, but you have some room for growth. And then threats are things that are really uh, need your attention. So that could be, say, you have no social media presence and somebody else in town is opening up a new center and they're killing it and they're taking a whole lot of the market share just because they have a, a really great presence. So this SWOT analysis can be for everything. And when you think about marketing, apply the same SWOT process. And so I want you to think just for a minute, and I would love to hear from some of you guys, when you think in the marketing realm specifically, what are some of your strengths already? Anybody just shout it out. Membership What's that? We have a strong membership base. Membership base, yeah. Okay, so, and your members are part of your marketing plan. We're actually gonna talk a little bit about that in a little bit too. Having your brand? Yes, like, yeah, having a strong brand. And, and again, we'll talk on that a little more too. Anybody else? What are, what are some of your strengths in marketing? We have a lot of community. Yes, being involved in the community. And Shawnee does a great job going live and you know showing people like what's happening at their center. Makes them feel like they're a part of that. Any other quick strengths? We have built a strong word of mouth. Strong word of mouth, having a really great referral network. Definitely. Yeah. Love it. Cross promote with other businesses locally. And I'm trying to repeat for everybody online to be able to hear too. So, um, and we're going to talk about some of these a little bit more specifically. Thinking about your weaknesses. Anybody care to share an area that you know you're just weak and like need some, some action on that? Consistency. Consistency. Yeah. <laughs> That's probably the biggest one that I hear across the industry. It, it's hard because you're wearing 17 hats and trying to do a million things. Christian? Creating reels. Creating reels. Yes, me too. <laughs> I do social media and reels. That's a weakness for me. Yeah. Like, uh, targets. 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 Okay. Yeah. So target markets can be a weakness. Yes. Yes. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. Um, opportunities. Again, those are things that like you're doing okay, but you feel like maybe you need to do a little bit more. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, yes. So um, having a really solid approach across multiple platforms and methodology. Um, so if you have a strong social media presence, what are you doing on the email side? And a lot of times it is imbalanced. And threats. So we're not going to dive into those. We talked a little bit about weaknesses, but just for the interest of time, we'll move on. Um, oh, there's a fun delay on this. Doo -doo. There we go. Um, before we go further, though, I want to talk about conversion funnels. And um, if you think about marketing as one giant group of people that you're trying to reach, then that is an opportunity. Okay, so your conversion funnel is so important to understand that the way you're reaching people in that kind of customer life cycle is different. So you have, you know, your actual visitors, you have followers, people who could be leads, um, and then you have your actual uh, customers. So if you're looking at it, what you're really trying to do is get everybody eventually to become a customer, but you have to start with those people who are following you, who are curious. And a lot of times that's going to start with either your referrals, having that strong word of mouth presence, or with paid ads. Okay? People have to know you exist before they can know that they like you. And the way that you're presenting that message is different. Because if you just go in with somebody and say, you know, join our membership, and they don't even know what the hell floating is, there's a mismatch there. Okay? So you've got to really warm them up. So you're warming them up from this like broad group of people to say, all right, you don't know anything about floating. Here's why you should be curious about floating. And then you're going to move them in. They're, they're learning about your process. And then you're going to eventually convert them into customers who may eventually become members. Come on. We're going to get there. And it's going to jump like five screens in a second, I bet. <laughs> okay, so there we go. Nope. The ideal uh, client avatar. If you were with us last year for the virtual conference, I talked a lot about this in my um, talk about social media. It's such a huge piece of all marketing efforts. So your ideal client avatar, you'll also hear a customer profile, the ICA, your avatar. It doesn't matter what you call it as long as you spend some time in this. And if you have paper, I would love it if you start like jotting down some of these notes about your ideal client avatar. Who are they? Why do you think they're gonna float with you? And you might know this already just by thinking about your best customers, your best guests, your best members. What do they do for a living? What is their familial status? Where are they on the gender spectrum? How old are they? What are some of their hobbies? Even understanding a little bit about their income. So those are things that you may not have exact data because we don't necessarily, we don't ask people like what's your income when you come into float. We don't ask these things, but as you're building relationships, you start to get to know these sorts of details. And then you take all of these ideas and you create an actual person, a persona that you are trying to talk to. So for our float center, this is Marnie and everything I write, everything I do for my marketing is to Marnie, everything. Okay. I'm talking to Marnie because I know her. I know that the reason she floats is for stress relief. That's the number one people come to my center. Okay. I know that she's an account manager, so she has an office job. Okay. That can be hard on her body, just a very sedentary lifestyle. Um, I know that she's married. She has two kids. She loves to float because what's really interesting, we had a moment this year where um, we typically stay pretty busy but we noticed looking ahead about two weeks on this schedule, we were packed on this one particular Wednesday, two weeks ahead of time. We're like, what is going on here? It was the first day of school. All the moms saw that it was the first day of school, kids are out of the house, they came to float with us. So that was a, a really great checkpoint for me to say, oh, that's our target market, we're hitting it. These are the people that I know are coming in to see us. And this is just a quick little easy way that we were able to validate that we were reaching our target market. And okay? it's not always just about like the big data, but to be able to look at that and pinpoint so precisely. And as people were coming in that day, they're like, yeah, the kids are back in school. The kids are back in school. And so we're like, oh yeah, we knew that. We knew that. But that also means that we could have run a special 
that you know kids are back in school come in and float and you don't even have to monetize that you don't have to push a sale because that people are coming in anyway so it's not just about offering a discount um but we know what her ha uh, her hobbies are she loves hiking she loves painting um, she's about 43 years old. And so everything that I'm doing, I am talking to Marnie, really trying to understand her mindset. Where does she shop? Go ahead. Um, how did you arrive at this? Is it based on data? Or... Um, some is data driven and some is really just getting to know your customers, having conversations. Um, my husband is amazing at customer service. People love to sit and talk to him. And we talk about things constantly. Such and such came in today because of X, Y, and Z. Or somebody was saying that they went to this store and really enjoyed this thing. Whatever it is, we talk about like the minutia. And that really helps us to get into their mindset. Some of it can be data-driven. Um, we do collect birthdays. you know, And so we know how old our guests are. We can pull all of that data out of our systems. So, go ahead. Do you have kind of a group with that party? I love that question. So... Do you have more than one ideal client avatar? And the answer is maybe. The answer is really get solid on one first. And if that one is filling your tanks, do you need more? Because you could convolute the message. If that one isn't filling the tanks, either you've got the wrong audience or you have an opportunity to also market to someone different, someone separately. When you're thinking about doing that, though, also take into consideration what is the vibe of your center, okay? We do have some folks who come in for chronic pain relief, but for us, when you come into our place, we don't give off that like medical pain relieving sort of vibe. Um, so for us, we're kind of sticking with just this one. It works really, really well. And it's really interesting that we have a salt cave, and if you know anything about halo therapy, the major benefit is all respiratory and some dermatological. So people come to see us and sit in our salt cave for stress relief. So we try to push the respiratory thing, but our market is so zoned in that we just say, you know what, just come relieve some stress in the salt cave too. And it works. So you can have multiple. And there are definitely some opportunities. I would love to hear. Does anybody here have experience with that? That you feel like you have? Go ahead. Um, we don't have a particular demographic at all. Mm -hmm. Everyone. Yeah. So I'm curious if you don't have a particular demographic that you're targeting, are you in an area that is already very, very well versed in floating? Uh, no, and I think no. that's why we get an influx of people to go yeah. to areas. Interesting. Yeah. And curiosity can be a big piece to consider. Curiosity can get them in, but then you have to get them to come back because curiosity is often, whenever you have that one-time visit and your retention rates, I would watch that if it's just a curiosity factor. Go ahead, Graham. Question, how, how long have you guys been open? Uh, since the end of 2016. Yeah, well, so. People a day, every day, other than July and August. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it'd be interesting to see if they go, it's, like, it's like anything that's new, especially because they're getting if floating is new to the, to the town of life, you'll get that very big mm -hmm. influx of curiosity as then everything kind of starts to round out as you get your niche and kind of start seeing the same kind of people that, that, that are returning the way that you kind of want model them to. Yes. It also has a lot to do with how you present yourself. Mm -hmm. We present ourselves neutrally. Yes. There is, no, there is no idea as to, well, am I accepted here? Right. Yeah, and there are definitely benefits and there are some opportunities to being in that neutral zone. Because one thing you don't want is to be so neutral that people walk in and they float and they're like, yeah, that was pretty cool. And then they leave and they don't feel like there's a reason for them to come back. If you have a place that is very inviting, that feels just warm and people want to be there, that can help as well. And that's part of your brand is like the vibe of your center. How does it feel? How comfortable are your chairs? Okay, those sorts of things all come into that overall um, experience for people. So I want to talk a little bit about a couple of the most common marketing methods. You probably know all of these. Hopefully you already have these in place. They're kind of the basics. Um, organic social media, just having a consistent practice of posting, create a schedule. Um, and I have last year's talk that I gave, gave you some tips on how to do that. Um, paid ads are huge. 
That's a great way to find new clients to bring in. And then we all talked about referrals. That can also be your membership base because those are the people who are going to stay with you. They love your services. They're coming in as often as they can. Um, trade shows. This is an area where some, some of us probably do okay, but it might be an opportunity to do a little bit more. I know it is for us. Um, we hit some of the health and wellness trade shows. We go do some um, like employee health benefits uh, shows, but there are a lot of other things that are happening. If you can get in a, you know, a yoga festival that's in town or an expo that's all related to like running or, um, you know, if there's a big race in your area, you have the opportunity to go set up a table at, at those events. So that's some of them. And then obviously your website itself is a marketing tool. It needs to be maximized. There are ways to really make it work for you, but just having a website itself is going to start that process. Um, one huge thing that I want everybody to do, go look at your website, see if it has two big things. One, your address. Where are you? What is your street address and what is your city? When I look at float centers, I can say probably about 50% don't have that listed. And if you don't have your address listed, people come across your website, they don't know how to get to you. Why should they bother staying on your website? Okay. You might not even be in their local market. Um, a second thing is your float tanks. Have some kind of photo out there, at least a description, something that shows people what it looks like to float with you. Because when you Google floating, what you see may be completely different than what you're offering at your center. And people may make an assumption that you have one particular model of a float tank and they don't like that model, and so they never come to see you. So there's a ton more that you should have on your website and how to you know, optimize it, but those are two big things that are just so often missed. You know? And if you're looking at it from that customer standpoint, a couple of little tweaks can go a long way. A few others, um, blogs. How many of you guys run a blog on your website? Okay, got about three or four hands. Any of you consistent? No. <laughs> one, one kind of maybe. <laughs> um, I'm terrible at it. It's on my to-do list, and I'll talk about my to-do list and my the next main stage thing. But I just haven't gotten there yet. Um, eventually, I think that I will. Uh, but having blogs can really help you in a way that you're probably not thinking about. Um, out of those who have blogs, what do you think is the real benefit of having those? Education. Education. That's definitely a huge benefit. Anybody else? Website ranking. Website ranking. Thank you. It's like, I know you guys. I'm looking over here in like this little tech circle. I'm like, I know. Your website ranking. So your SEO, search engine optimization results, if you're constantly putting fresh content on your website, the Google gods love you, okay? That is an easy way to keep getting a little bit more ranking, okay? Keywords, if you have a blog with some specific benefits about floating, okay, that's gonna help when people are searching for, you know, natural ways to relieve migraines and they're in your area. You know, having things like that can help. Um, your blog can do a lot. Backlinks. I don't want to get too technical in there, but every opportunity that you get, if you have a chance to write, say, an article for a local organization, and maybe there's a company that wants to provide some information to their employees about stress relief or about pain relief or an insurance company that um, has a lot of folks that they're dealing with who have chronic pain issues. If you write a blog or you write something for them, even if they're hosting it on their platform, have them backlink it to your website, okay? Okay. If you can get in with some of the bigger ones, local news outlets, they have a lot of traffic. And if they're linking to your website, that's a strong backlink. If you're just kind of helping each other and like somebody doesn't have a lot of traffic, their website isn't doing really well and they backlink you, eh, you're not going to see a lot of results from that. But as many places as you can. Go ahead, John. It's important to tell too, like you don't absolutely have to write from the locations, but backlinks yes. are just tell people like, you can go to my website, I'm really on your specific site, especially if it has a, a high degree of authority on Google, meaning like it's already ranked high, then you're going to rank high as a result of that. And you got it. 
random shout out like to SEM Josh, it's actually free. Mm -hmm. Totally just get the tool and look at all your backlinks and look at all your competitors' backlinks or look at all your friends and you the backlinks. You got it's it. It's a really great tool. Yeah, uh, SEM, Rush. SEM Rush. SEM Rush. It, it's really, really helpful. It's something that I just started uh, looking into myself. Um, but SEM Rush, anywhere that you can, ask people, you know, if, if you've got a news story coming in to, to talk about your center, ask them specifically, will you link my website in the article? A lot of local news places won't do it. They'll do a story on you, they've got the video, but they don't automatically put your website link in there. Ask them to do that. Um, be really, really clear about that. If you've got a physician who comes in regularly, you know, ask him if they've got a lot of, you know, great traffic hitting their sites, ask those people specifically to link to yours. And not just your homepage, okay? So it's great to have your homepage linked in other places, but if you've got a page that talks specifically about stress relief, link that particular thing. So it's not just getting traffic to your, your landing page. And a lot of people don't even go into those extra layers, so that's gonna help to boost those things in the search results too. Go ahead. You have a common reluctance to, to these backlinks from folks? What do you ask? Um, it depends on the, the group. You know, if they feel like you're trying to take advantage of them, like they may. But a lot of like local news stories and things, they, they'll do it very quickly and easily. You just have to remind them because they're not thinking about that particular, you know, thing for you. They, it's for them, they've got a story. They've got an interest piece that they can fill airtime. And so they're not necessarily doing it to help you market they're helping to fill their airtime. But some might be already already doing that. Like if it's a local news segment that loves to talk about small businesses, that might already be a piece of it. If you're working with other small businesses, there might be some, you know, but I would say there's nothing that I can think of like from a grand level. Go ahead, John. This is what I find. When people come to the flow center, oftentimes they're writers. They want to write their own blogs. Yeah. This is where you get the biggest bad news. They write their own blog about them writing about your flow center, and of course they're going to those are the most wholesome, yeah. organic you can get. You got it. If you can get some really good bloggers, um, yeah, then those are going to send you some great traffic. So if it's somebody who's just starting out, you got to understand they're, they're probably in the same boat as you, and they're trying to build their rankings as well. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. So she's sharing if you um, have a local chamber of commerce, if you have other organizations, um, a lot of downtowns just have associations or things. Very, it's, it's similar to a chamber, but they might call themselves something different, but getting them to link for you as well. And those are groups that typically are all about it. That's why they exist and they want to help you promote. So um, let's talk about partnerships. I'd love to hear some ideas on this. So other local businesses are good, but not just anybody, okay? A lot of folks will come in and say, hey, I really like this. Can we give a discount code to our customers for you? And that sounds great, but are, you, are they a really good fit? Are their customers your customers? And can you all actually create a really good relationship from this? I'd love to hear, does anybody have a partnership you feel goes really, really well? Mm -hmm. uh, they do ten new yeah. And they do them at our, our center a couple times a month. Wow. People can go prior to their yeah. session. Um, it's on a side note, they're going awesome. Mm -hmm. um, it's really and, cool. But but as far as the partnership goes, definitely I guess we're talking about backlinks, like obviously I should be taking better advantage of that. They have a great website. Mm -hmm. You could be promoting us more. Yeah. Definitely. And that's a big piece. Sometimes you'll have a partnership and like, you're like, yes, let's do this. Let's promote each other. And then you might mention it to five people over the course of a couple of months at checkout. That's not a partnership. That's like your buddy that, you know, who's, hey, you should go check this place out. Like that's not an actual partnership. I'll tell you something funny. We're not mm -hmm. related, but there's this really posh uh, sushi lounge mm -hmm. where I'm from and we love these people and they love us. So we just give their employees, anyone that joins our team a float. Mm -hmm. And then we keep our beginners guys floating over there and all their sushi chefs on the island making sushi talk about it because they just have the experience. And like that has become That's one awesome. of the top 10 referrals. Wow. They send us hundreds of people yeah. a year. It's crazy. It is. Imagine, but it's also my wife and I. They're like, 
<laughs> yeah. Seriously, so like you can find these awesome partnerships mm -hmm. people you never suspected. Yes. It's really cool. Yeah. So local restaurants can be a really great source. And, you know, especially if you're in an area where people go to this particular restaurant um, and maybe if they're out of towners or maybe they just have a really solid customer base already, they have their regulars and everybody knows everybody. It's, I mean, talking about floating is probably one of the most interesting things. Everybody's curious about it. And, you know, even something as simple as like saying to people, hey, if you are standing around in a social interaction and you don't know what to say, talk about floating. Boom. Go ahead. Another vote for ketamine clinics. If you'll mm -hmm. have that going in your, your local market and not recommend it enough. Yeah. Um, it's a perfect demographic for what we offer and very, awesome. very strong alignment on the mission. Um, we also have a great partnership with an IV bar mm -hmm. in town. We don't offer IVs at the lab, but someone's paying 175 to 400 dollars for an IV, they're probably also interested in potentially yeah. coming to float. What's really cool about our relationship there is our employees uh, get discounts on each other's services. So mm -hmm. the IV infusionists are talking to people while they're floating. Yeah. And then our employees will also be able to go over there and get like free adjustments for G12 shots. Yes. So yeah. IV clinics, ketamine clinics, a lot of other wellness providers, definitely. Um, go ahead in the back. Hi. Oh. Mm -hmm. Like the owner of businesses is there and you have a relationship because I've noticed that if I built a group through partnership mm -hmm. and then I never see them again, I never see them again. Yes. And I always forget that there's this massive like human mm -hmm. human element to it of I, I'm here and I give you my because I like as a bartender it's a very big thing too. Those folks will not come sit at my bar if I don't come sit at their bar. Yeah. And it's really easy to forget because you got it. I'm very busy. And that's why, you know, we won't ever start a partnership with anybody off after their first float. So many people come out totally euphoric. I loved it. I'm going to send everybody here. And then if you never hear from them again, like you went through all the effort of creating a flyer, a promo code, whatever it is that you're putting together for them. And that's wasted effort. But if you've got somebody that you've noticed, they keep coming in and keep coming in. And then they're talking about, hey, can I grab a couple more brochures today? Like that's when you start really asking questions. Like, what do you do? Who are you giving those to? Um, we have a chiropractor who sends us his patients a lot. Um, we're, we haven't finalized anything just yet, but we're hoping to have him actually come. He has a mobile unit and we want to have him come set up at our building and do chiropractic adjustments and floating in combination. Um, we have a local acupuncturist who used to be located in the same building as us, but she's across the street now. And we're referring people constantly back and forth to each other. We keep her brochures. She keeps ours. We have people who come out and they're talking about specific issues that they have. Like, this was really great for my low back, but I've still got an issue with my wrist and, you know, I want to do something else. And I can send them to her. And then she's sending people over to see us constantly. And, you know, we both use each other's services. We both refer each other's products. We both sell retail. And so, you know, if there's something that I don't have that she has, I'm like, yeah, run across the street, go over there and get this. And we have little discount cards that we can give. If you go over to her, her clinic and buy this product, you get X percent off. And so we have cards even for specific retail products. And she kind of prescribes for her people to come over and buy some of our, uh, our retail products. Go ahead, Johnny. I just want to say, too, because we're in infancy, right? We mm -hmm. don't Mm -hmm. um, events. Yes. And so we have a partnership we're working with a local climbing gym because they do a lot of corporate events. Yeah. And and they really wanted to help incorporate us. And so so we go back and forth a lot on their promotions. Currently, they're doing an adaptive climbing program mm -hmm. for individuals with disabilities, and we partnered with them on that so that both their volunteers and their climbing crews will be coming over to yes. work with us. And then we're constantly. I love it. I love it. It's a, a great thing. If you have another business who already does corporate events, piggyback there because it is so it's really hard to get that going. And I think that's one of the most common questions that people have is like, how do I set up a corporate membership? What should I do? How should that work? And really, the, the possibilities are endless. But if you have somebody else who's already offering something, you can talk to them. What are you offering? That way I can make my offer pair really well with yours and you know work through that together and of course you're cross-promoting 
And then those, you know, those corporate uh, clients are coming in and then they're going out and telling all of their friends. So a really great ripple effect on that. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm piggyback on the climbing, the climbing again one as a climber. It's pretty obvious for me because I go to the gym. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're going to be hanging a banner there when I get back. Nice. And um, hopefully we have a website. Yeah. That's, that's a cool partnership. Um, there's also a local, kind of call it like a healthcare mastermind. It's mm -hmm. kind of like this just networking thing we do once a month with different uh, practitioners in the, in the, in the area. And right. It's been a really cool one to meet, to meet other local businesses. Is yeah, we're all kind of in the same sort of mm -hmm. bandwidth, you know. And your local business owner community is another great network that you can tap into, and you know, just getting to know them, and that's a good place where you can kind of test some ideas, give them a free float. You know, if you're a member of your chamber or some other organization, offer free floats to them, see who comes in, and see what they do with that, how much they enjoy it, and then you can kind of start going from there. So, I have a question yeah. For I have a hunch that, like, I mean, there are companies that have money to throw around as an employee, mm -hmm. you know, well-being. There's people staring at screens all day. Yes. And, you know, they're creative people building stuff. I, I feel like floating, floating would be so, so mm -hmm. great, such a good crossover for a benefit or a perk for tech companies. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm just wondering if anyone's nailed that yeah. down at all. Anybody have experience helping with a tech company? Do you? Well, not necessarily tech, but it was, I, I wanted to make a comment. I'm sorry I keep commenting. Yeah. I was going to make is along this line of when people come forward with conversations you need to know them, you find out what they do when they mm -hmm. work for something like mm -hmm. that. One of the questions I like to ask is do you have a health and wellness director? Mm -hmm. Because if they have an entire section of their company, because guess what? They get an email every month right. from that health and wellness director. Yeah. And, you know, for the sake of uh, morale and health and within our organization, you know, go try this. I get lots of people from like Salesforce or Rolls Royce. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Yes. Yeah. And that's a big piece for, because you can just throw it out there and say, we have corporate wellness packages, but it's probably not going to stick. It really does take a lot of legwork reaching out to those companies and talking to an HR director, a benefits director, somebody of that nature. And they can really help you to guide like how much money they have, how do they want it to work, all of those sorts of things. And, and truly, I think most corporate wellness packages that are successful are completely custom. Because if you just put out, this is what we offer, that might offer that might work for some companies, but not for others. Um, go ahead. Yeah, we've had some mild luck with like 100 to 200 person companies. Mm -hmm. When you start getting into the big tech companies, it's some weird quirk with like HR liability. We're paying dollars and it's a stressful workplace environment. Yes. Possible, but that was what we've heard from three yeah. of the larger companies, Facebook and Google. And yeah. yeah, it's so, it's pretty fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> they don't want to admit that they're well, stressful well, workplace. Really well, one company is uh, it's like just employee reimbursable if they come in. Mm -hmm. So it's not like a they're not locked into a pre package number. Yeah. Hang on just a second. I was in, uh, Lindsay Ward wants to know, does anyone partner with any large nonprofits that benefit flow centers at all? Okay, so a virtual ten attendee is asking if anybody partners with a nonprofit organization. Does anybody have nonprofits that do well? She's going to be so sad. I know. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Lindsay. Anybody? I can, so I, can, I can speak a little bit to it, but it's more of a contribution. It mm -hmm. has led to, and this is uh, with the VA. Mm -hmm. Um, so I have not successfully landed any contracts. In fact, I'm really interested to listen to you, learn about that. But um, that's been one organization that has, I think, paid. And it's, it's, I'm not necessarily caring more about helping the veterans. Right. I care more about that. Like, but it, I think it's paid for itself mm -hmm. in whatever I've contributed because it's brought their families and their friends and good mm -hmm. community like feeling about it. Right. But I wanted to also mention something. Has anyone considered this? Because this is what I thought. There's an organization that represents employer-provided health care funds. Mm -hmm. And we have actually gotten our name in the header for those packets that are mm -hmm. given out when they are issued mm -hmm. employer-provided HSA and FSA cards. Mm -hmm. and we accept those forms of payment. And I would say 50% of everything that comes through the door is... HSA mm -hmm. and FSA. That's awesome. That's really awesome. So 
HS <laughs> boom beer. Um, HSA and FSA are really great if you can get that approved for your center. That depends on your payment processor. So if you want to get that set up, contact your payment processor. You may have some back and forth. You may have to provide some documentation. You may not. Mine was honestly a quick email and they were like, all right, you're set up. Great. Um, it, from what I hear, it's usually not that simple for people. So yay yeah, us. Um, but it can be a really great thing. And then continuing to remind people that they can use HSA and FSA at your location. And that's again, where if you're contacting an HR manager, a benefits manager, and having those conversations and saying, you know, we also accept HSA and FSA, that's a huge thing for them to be able to say, here's another way to use your benefits. Go ahead, Jeannie. Yeah, well, I just think specific with the HSA and FSA, because I mean, I'm a nurse and I mm -hmm. accepted. And that was the only way I was able to be allowed mm. to accept it by getting an NPI. Yeah. Um, does anybody know? Specific for, I was required to give an NPI. Yeah. Too. So I, yeah. I, could you give another quote on that? Hmm. Yeah, we're, we're considered an alternative uh, health and wellness center through our payment processor. And so um, it might it might be something that could be state state specific where you have to be a healthcare provider licensed. There's um, also so. a difference between HSA yes. and FSA. Yes, 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 and some might get covered. We're considered other personal services, so um, there are different classifications, and not every HSA or FSA will cover that particular category. So that could be another layer of complexity. Mm -hmm. Yes. You got it. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we've said. We, well, we get asked mm -hmm. frequently, and we just tell them like it depends on the on the plan as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so if your card works, we accept it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. We'll try to run anything. Like we'll take whatever payment you got. Go ahead. Nice. Yeah. By fighting your associations for your services, mm -hmm. a good place to put it at. Yes. I put it in that magazine. Yeah. And so I give out their first free float. Mm -hmm. And then if they want to continue, they get a discount rate. Right. And that seems to work. Awesome. Firefighters and police officers. Awesome. So, and you tapped on another, you know, method that's up here is other sorts of media. And that other sort of media involves magazines. It could be local. Um, I would recommend more local, obviously, than national, unless you just want to help the whole industry, in which case, please do. Um, but local magazines that have a really strong readership. Um, and that could, again, like find those niche groups and tap into them, ask them if they have any kind of ads and things that you can do. Um, we were talking earlier about, you know, local events and things. And if you're at trade shows, find out, like, do they also have a magazine or some kind of publication that they're giving out to people that you can put something in print? Um, obviously, you know, uh, commercials, television commercials, overall, I think as an industry, we've all said those really just don't seem to be very effective and the same for radio. But some... Some, and, and that's where I'm going. A couple of people have had great success with that. So would you mind sharing um, what your, well, do you have a secret? I'm, I'm 12 pounds yeah. Anecdotes, right? mm -hmm. So, so that I, is probably the reason it's effective. Mm -hmm. But I have had so many people that stop me on the street and go, oh my gosh, I saw your commercial at your place. It was amazing. Like that's, it's, I yeah. hear that all the time. And a lot of, we have a lot of social media people that come in. That's mm -hmm. probably our biggest. Mm -hmm. But our next biggest is our television. That's awesome. So, yeah. So some, and, and that's, watch local TV in my area yes. And, and you got an, that goes back to that ideal client avatar. You know, your people so well, you know, that they watch local stations, not just, you know, cable or just podcasts or things like that. Go ahead. Question, uh, you and, and also mm -hmm. um, for marketing, we were, we were recently approached and kind of evaluating how doing uh, ads Movies. Mm -hmm. movies yeah. At local cinemas, and we, I think, probably nationwide now, but almost all of our local cinemas now are like dine in mm -hmm. with a full bar and all that. Stuff. Yeah, that's awesome. And they were running some, what we thought were pretty, like, it was pretty cheap mm -hmm. overall for a year's worth of ads mm -hmm. before every movie. And I was just wondering if anyone had success with that. And I'm curious to you, if for those who are online, if you've, um, Mark is asking if anybody has run any um, ads before movies, so at movie theaters. So. 
So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. That's probably because they had no revenue from people coming in. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. Yeah. I love it when people start getting excited and be like, ah. Yes. Yeah. Hulu, I, I was going to ask, we chatted about that. Hulu has a, an option where you can manage your own ads, submit everything. Um, I haven't tried it. We, I think we talked about that before. Have you gone live with that? Oh, yeah. yeah. And, I ran it for the last seven months, minimal $500 ad spend. Yep. Um, the biggest challenge we're running to, and Andy will even tell you, is just getting the video uploaded. Yeah. Did you not? They're, they're very particular about the formats. But I will tell you, if you can... As long as you're following the formats, you're rendering it out correctly, your color space and everything else is accurate. But if you do hire a filmmaker or somebody that's just really good with video, or your cousin, or you maybe, <laughs> you get it up, up there and it will just run before the content. You can specify the different points of interest, the types of media, the types of demographics. This is really cool. Yeah. And you always get people that's like, I was watching Hulu the other day and I saw your ad. It's always like, that's really cool. You saw my ad. Yes. <laughs> Of course, yeah, they, they do not have a hugely robust analytics platform, but I'm just expecting that that will grow as it, as it moves on. I will say, if anyone does, you guys have Spectrum um, or like some of the cable things, they've now just released self-service platforms for injecting commercials onto public television. Yeah. It's amazing. I just, I just launched this a month ago. That's what you should look at. Look at the, the self-service commercial thing too. That one. Awesome. Yeah. So there, I feel like some of that might be shifting and especially getting into some of those streaming apps. And honestly, if you think about it, when you're watching a show, you're typically binge watching it. And a lot of those shows will show the same commercial like five times in a row. So you could get some pretty decent exposure from some of that. Last one, then we'll move on. Yes. Those are the ones you want to call because they'll get you in all different locations mm -hmm. and also that's a good way to partner up yep. with whoever's on that digital signage. Yes. So digital signage, you can do like digital billboards. There, there. there. Yes. Everywhere. Lots of different methods for that. Yeah. It's all over media for us. It's not digital, but, but it's like at the bathrooms. All right, I want to bring this back a couple more and then um, this conversation I'm sure will continue. Uh, I love um, another another good one, uh, depending on your area podcasts. If you can be a guest on somebody else's podcast, that's a really awesome thing. Some places already have their own, you know, some float centers have their own podcasts and do really, really well with that. Um, there's a certain somebody in the middle of the room who does a great live podcast, but they're, <laughs> so if you haven't seen it before, go check out Floating Light, um, their Facebook page. Uh, you guys haven't done them recently during the pandemic though, have you? No, okay. Yeah, they'll come back. But if you go back and look through some of their past videos, really, really cool, full setup, just a really awesome vibe. Uh, Jonathan does a really, really fantastic job with that. And it's just a, a really cool thing for people to be able to see your space and hear you talking about it, hearing guests who are coming out of floats and um, just a really great way to kind of share the, the people behind the business too. Go ahead. You said depending on your area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think there are some areas where people just, parts of the country where podcasting just hasn't really picked up yet um, or certain demographics where podcasting hasn't picked up. If you're going for, say, chronic pain issues and your target market is like 65 to 75 years old, you're probably not going to find you on a podcast, you know, but if you've got a lot of tech folks who are coming in, um, then that's probably a pretty good place to be. Get on those tech podcasts, something that they would be listening to. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a health and wellness or a stress relief or something like that, but think about who their audience is would their audience benefit from knowing about you? And would the podcast enjoy having you on or not? Go ahead, Shani. And two, I've been on two podcasts. 
-hmm. Yes, you got it. And that's a backlink that's going to help bump your search results. So you're getting their audience and you're getting, you know, hopefully a strong backlink if it's a really well-known um, podcast. Um, so there's a million ideas. And whenever you're creating your marketing plan, one big, big thing to know is that you can't do it all at once, okay? You might hire an agency who's gonna take everything and, and do it all at once for you, um, but start small. Like, what is your first step? And it doesn't have to be this order at all. This is just a sample of what that might look like. And you're gonna start with one thing and get really solid on that. Post consistently on your social media. Start running paid ads. Whatever it is, figure out what that particular thing is and get that steady state before you're doing more. Because if you start spreading your attention across every option that's out there, you're diluting your efforts, you're gonna get burnout, you're not gonna see results, and so you've wasted your time. So come up with what feels like something easier for me to implement, start there. Then go to the next thing, then go to the next thing. And remember, you don't have to do it all. And it might be a case where an opportunity comes up. You're not ready for that yet because you're still focusing on something else. Just say to people, I'm not in a position to do that right now, but can I call you in six months? Because you've laid out your plan and you know that in six months, you're going to be focusing on your partnerships. And that could be a place that you want to start. Okay? There's nothing wrong with saying not now. We have that tendency to say, you know what? I want to do this. I'm going to do this right now. I do that a lot. And then I never actually get good results because I'm not being consistent. Okay? So figure out what makes sense for you. Create your timeline. Within that timeline, set a budget. Okay? By a quick show of hands, who spends $0 a month in marketing? Okay. Two. Who spends, say, $200? Okay. And anybody spend 1000 or more? Yeah, there's a lot of hands that, that came up for $1,000 or more. And out of that, are you seeing a good ROI? Because that's the, the last piece. And if you're starting to do a whole lot of things at once, this gets really, really hard. Because you just launched 15 different marketing methods. How do you know which one's working? Okay, start with one and then start to really monitor that. Is this working or not? And if it's not, and, you, and keep in mind, you have to give it a little time, depending on whatever that you know, method is, typically a couple of months. You don't want to be jumping, do something for a week and say, oh, that didn't work. What's next? you got to really let it play out before you're going to see some results. There are short game marketing things that you can do. There are long game. Organic social media, long game. Paid ads, typically a little bit shorter. You're going to get people in the door a little faster. Referrals often a long game, okay? Um, you're doing rewards programs, referrals, you might get somebody in you know, here and there, but then it starts to speed up. The more people you have talking about you, it kind of takes that snowball effect. But everything that you're doing, you also wanna be able to measure, okay? As much as possible. And sometimes those measure, measurements, uh, Tiffany gave a talk earlier on the KPIs, sometimes those measurements might not be something really, really tangible on our report, but it could be something that you're noticing a different trend and the stories that are, are happening when people are coming in. Lots of different things. So we have seven minutes. So two things. If you have questions, feel free to email me. This is my email address. Um, we passed around, for those who are in the room, we passed around a paper. Um, I'm happy to send you a marketing plan template for everybody online. Shoot me an email, and I'll be happy to send that to you. Give me some time. <laughs> it will not be today or tomorrow. It probably won't be next week because I'm going to like crawl into an introvert cave for a few days when I get home. <laughs> um, but feel free to send me an email. Uh, one of my goals for the next year or so is to be able to start offering opportunities for you guys um, to be able to, to connect more and to share ideas. I think there's so much value in that conversation and these ideas of I tried this and it worked or this didn't work for me, but it might work for you. So everybody out there, thank you all for attending. Mm -hmm.